everybody, it's Chef Bates, and we are back with Serve Safe Chapter 5, The Flow of Food, Purchasing, Receiving, and Storage. Yay! It's so exciting. I'm, I'm sure you are excited. Now, so far in Chapter 4, we kind of did an introduction to what's this flow of food all about. Now we're going to get into the specifics of the first three stages. We're going to go over specifically approved suppliers, accepting or rejecting deliveries, and how you go about storing your food once you get it. The chapter is actually split up into two sections. It's split up into uh, sort of a what should I do and how should I do it. So we're going to start off with the what should I do section. Uh, you know, you can't make unsafe food safe. So you have to take uh, special precautions to only bring safe food into your operation. Purchasing food from approved, reputable suppliers and following good receiving procedures will help to ensure the safety and quality of the food your operation is going to use. Now, before you accept any deliveries, you must make sure that the food you purchase is safe. The next nine slides go over what you should do to keep your food deliveries safe. Food must be purchased from approved, reputable suppliers. These suppliers have been inspected and can show you an inspection report. They also meet all applicable local, state, and federal laws. This applies to all suppliers in the supply chain. Your operations chain can include growers, shippers, packers, manufacturers, distributors, I mean, you know, the trucking fleets and the warehouses, um, and plus local markets. It would be a smart idea to develop a relationship with your suppliers and get to know their food safety practices. Consider uh, looking over their most recent inspection report. They'll give it to you if you ask. These reports can be from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, you know, the USDA, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, or a third-party inspector. All of these things are based on good manufacturing practices, also known as GMPs, or good agricultural practices, known as GAPs. When you're looking over that inspection report, uh, look for the following things. That they've been inspected in terms of their receiving and storage, their processing, their shipping, their cleaning and their sanitizing, their personal hygiene, the way they train their staff, of course, the recall program that they use, and the HACCP program or other food safety system they have in place. Many operations establish supplier lists that are, that are based on the company's specifications, standards, and procedures. However, only approved suppliers should be included on those lists. So, in other words, McDonald's has a list of suppliers that all McDonald's in America use for all their products. But none of those suppliers have not been inspected. Of course they have. Suppliers must deliver food when staff has enough time to do inspections. That just makes sense. Don't accept a delivery when you're at your peak hours, when you're really crazy busy. It's very important that you schedule deliveries at a time when the delivery can be correctly received. You must take action to ensure that the receiving and inspection process is smooth and safe. Make specific staff responsible for receiving, and then train them to follow food safety guidelines. Provide the staff with the tools they need, including purchase orders, thermometers, and scales. Make sure that enough trained staff are available to receive and inspect food items promptly. Deliveries must be inspected immediately upon receipt. The process starts with a visual inspection of the delivery truck. Check it for signs of contamination. Walk around it. Look at the overall condition. Look for signs of pests. Look inside. You see a mouse? There's a problem. If you see any issue at all with the truck itself, reject the whole delivery. Continue with a visual inspection of the food items. Make sure they have been received at the correct temperature. Once they've been inspected, food items must be stored as quickly as possible in the correct areas. This is especially true for refrigerated and frozen items. Now, some food service operations receive food after hours when they are closed for business. This is often referred to as a key drop delivery. The supplier is given a key or other access to the operation to make the delivery. Products are placed in coolers, freezers, and dry storage areas. The delivery has to be inspected once you arrive at the operation the next day, and it's got to meet certain conditions. Key drop deliveries used to be something that was new and kind of exciting. Nowadays, with Amazon delivering stuff to people's houses when they're not there, 
it's sort of expected. The rules for accepting a key drop delivery are different than the rules for accepting a delivery from like Amazon. Uh, the key drop delivery is inspected as soon as the kitchen manager or other staff member arrives at work, right away, right when they get there. The delivery has to come from an approved source, and it has to be placed in the correct storage location and maintain the correct temperature. It has to be protected from contamination overnight, it can't show any signs of being contaminated, and it has to be honestly presented. In other words, what it says it is on the outside has to be what it is on the inside. If you do have to reject an item, and sometimes that happens, set it aside from the items that you are accepting. Then tell the delivery guy exactly what's wrong with that rejected thing. Make sure you get a signed adjustment or credit slip before giving the item back to the delivery person. Finally, log the incident on the invoice or the receiving document so you have a record and they have a record. Occasionally, you may be able to recondition and use items that would have been rejected. For example, a shipment of cans with a contaminated dirty surface could be cleaned, allowing them to be used. However, the same cans may not be reconditioned if they are damaged. That's something else altogether. Food items you have received may sometimes be recalled by the manufacturer. This may happen when food contamination is confirmed or even suspected. It can also occur when items have been mislabeled or misbranded. Often food is recalled when food allergens have not been identified on the label. That's actually pretty common. Most vendors will notify you of the recall. However, you should also monitor recall notifications made by the FDA and the USDA just to make sure you're not serving any food that's been recalled. Follow these guidelines if you've been notified of a recall. Identify the recalled food items by matching information from the recall notice to that item. It might include the manufacturer's ID, the time the item was manufactured, and the item's use-by date. Remove the item from your inventory and place it in a secure and appropriate location. It might be a cooler or a dry storage area. The recalled item must be stored separately from all the rest of your food, your utensils, your equipment, linens, and even single-use items like disposable cups. You need to label that item in a way that will prevent it from being placed back into inventory. Some operations do that by slapping a big old do not use or do not discard label on recalled food items. Uh, make sure that you tell your staff, hey guys, don't use that thing. Refer to the vendor's notification or recall notice for what to do with it. For example, you might be instructed to just throw it away and sometimes you'll need to return it to the vendor. So that's what you're supposed to do. But how exactly do you do all those things? That's what the rest of this chapter is all about. How to check different types of food for safety and quality. And the most basic way we do that is by checking temperatures. In general, there are three ways to check the temperature of food. With meat, poultry, and fish, you're going to insert the thermometer stem or probe directly into the thickest part of the food, usually the center. Just open it up a big old pack of chicken, pick one at random, take its temperature. Now, it's not quite so easy with reduced oxygen packaging, also known as ROP food, or modified atmosphere packaging, which is called MAP food, vacuum-packed food, and sous vide food. With those, you're going to insert the thermometer stem or probe between two packages. If the package allows, you could even fold it around the thermometer stem, but you're going to have to be careful not to puncture the package. With other packaged food, you'll open it up, insert the thermometer stem or probe into the food. The sensing area must be fully immersed. Remember, the stem or probe must not touch the package. You'll contaminate it. For everything else, you know, pretty much all our cold time and temperature control for safety foods, you got to receive those at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, you know, right at the very bottom of the temperature danger zone. Everything else is a little bit different. With live shellfish, you know, oysters, mussels, clams, scallops, you're going to receive those at an air temperature of 45 degrees Fahrenheit and an internal temperature of no more than 50. Of course, you'll need to cool those guys down pretty quick. Cool them to 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower within four hours. With shucked shellfish, that's oysters that have been opened or clams that have been opened, it's the same rules apply. Receive at 45 degrees Fahrenheit and cool to 41 as quickly as possible. 
at least four hours, please. With milk, we'll receive that at 45 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're going to cool it to 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower within four hours. Eggs, hey, same thing. 45 degrees Fahrenheit, chilled 41 within four hours. Is there a trend? Nope, it ends here. With hot food that you're receiving, and not that many restaurants receive it, but you might, it has to be received at the very top of the temperature danger zone, which is 135 degrees Fahrenheit or hotter. With frozen food, uh, make it sure it's frozen absolutely solid. Sometimes when you get frozen food, you might have to reject that too. There's two big reasons you're going to reject it. If you see fluid or water stains in the bottom of cases or on the packaging, that indicates that food has been time temperature abused. It probably thawed. Or if you see a bunch of ice crystals forming on the top of the food, that shows that the food is thawed and been refrozen. Both cases, definitely um, the time to send it back. This is not food you want to eat. With eggs and live shellfish, the guidelines tell us you're going to have to receive this at an air temperature of 45 degrees Fahrenheit or less. What they're talking about when they say that is the air temperature inside the refrigerated truck, not the temperature inside the case of eggs. When they say the milk needs to be delivered at 45 degrees Fahrenheit and then quickly cooled to 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, they're again talking about the way the food got from the warehouse to your restaurant. All shellfish. Fish that will be served raw like sushi and farm-raised fish is packaged and shipped with an identification tag. As a general rule of thumb, you must hold on to that tag for 90 days in case somebody gets sick from that batch of seafood. But there are some specific rules about identification tags that are used with different types of seafood. Shellfish like oysters, clams, mussels, and scallops, they all have to be received with a shell stock identification tag. These tags indicate when and where the shellfish were harvested. They also ensure that the shellfish are from an approved source, an approved waterway. Store your shellfish in the original container. Do not remove the shell stock tag from the container until the very last oyster or clam has been sold. When the very last shellfish is sold, write the date on the tag and then keep the tag on file for 90 days. Fish that are going to be eaten raw or partially cooked also have to be received with the correct documentation. The document is going to tell us if the fish was correctly frozen before you received it. Keep these documents for 90 days from the sale of the fish. And the last one, farm-raised fish. Um, if we're talking about farm-raised fish, they have to have documentation that states the fish was raised to the FDA standards. These documents also have to be kept for 90 days from the sale of fish. Poor food quality? That can be a sign that the food has been time temperature abused and therefore might be unsafe. It's important that you work with your supplier to define specific safety and quality criteria for the food items you typically receive. Reject food if it has any of the following problems. Okay, appearance. If the food is moldy or has an abnormal color, food that is moist when it's supposed to be dry, like salami, <laughs> Reject it. Do not accept any food item at all that shows signs of pests or pest damage. I mean, that should go without saying, right? Texture. Reject meat or fish or poultry that is slimy or sticky or dry. Also reject it if it has a soft flesh that leaves an imprint when you touch it. As far as rejecting things goes, uh, if it smells funny, no. Reject food with an abnormal or unpleasant odor. Uh, in addition, you should always reject any item if it doesn't meet your own restaurant's standards for quality because different restaurants have different standards. Both food items and non-food items, such as single-use cups, utensils, and napkins, must be packaged correctly when you receive them. Items should be delivered in their original packaging with a manufacturer's label. The packaging should be intact and clean. It also should protect food and food contact surfaces from contamination. Reject food and non-food items if packaging has any of these following problems, man. If it has tears or holes or punctures, just say no. You don't need that nonsense. When it comes to canned items, uh, that's a whole different story. There are a number of reasons you might send cans back to the vendor. Um, if there's big dents. Big old dents. No. Deep dents. No. Dents in the seam itself that goes around the top. Definitely not. Missing labels or torn labels. No. 
Swollen or bulging ends, that's incredibly important. That's a big no. Holes or visible signs of leaking, uh, that's also a big no. And rust, no! All food that is packaged in a reduced oxygen environment, such as vacuum pack meat, must be rejected if the package is bloated or leaking. Items with broken cartons or seals or with dirty and discolored packaging should also be rejected. Do not accept cases or packages that appear to have been tampered with. Don't do it. That's, that's, that's dumb. A couple more reasons to reject things. So, it's wet and it shouldn't be. No. It's got some leaks. No. It's even got a water stain. No. That item was wet and then dried out. It's no good. It may seem obvious, but pests or pest damage, no. Even if it's just a chew mark on the side of the carton, no. And of course, of course, the date. Food items have to be correctly labeled. Do not accept food that is missing a use-by date or expiration date from the manufacturer. You won't know when it needs to be thrown away. This date is the recommended last date for the product to be at peak quality. Reject items that have passed their use-by or expiration date. Some operations will label food items with the date the item was received to help with stock rotation during storage. You may see other dates on labels, like a sell-by date, which tells a store how long to display something for sale, or a best-by date, which is the date the product should be eaten for best flavor or quality. Sell-by dates and best-by dates are called quality dates, not safety they don't have anything to do with safety. They're just about quality. We're concerned with use-by and expiration dates because that tells us when something has to be thrown away. Following good storage guidelines for food and non-food items is going to help keep those items safe and preserve their quality. In general, you should label and date mark your food correctly. You also have to rotate food and store it at the correct temperature. Finally, you need to store items in a way that prevents cross-contamination. And let's start off with labeling. Labeling food is important for many reasons. Illnesses have occurred when unlabeled chemicals were mistaken for food, such as flour, sugar, or baking powder. Customers have suffered allergic reactions when food was unknowingly prepped with a food allergen that just wasn't labeled. So all items that aren't in their original containers must be labeled. The food label should include the common name of the food or a statement that clearly and accurately identifies it. It's not necessary to label food if it's clearly it's not going to be mistaken for something else. The food needs to be easily identified on site. In other words, you should label flour, since flour might look like a bunch of other things in the bakery. But you don't need to label apples. We can look at an apple and go, hey, that's an apple. What goes on the label of food that has been prepped for use is very important. All prep food that is going to be held for longer than 24 hours must be labeled. The label has to include the item name, the date it was prepared, and the date the item must be discarded. In this case, the limes are going to be good for three days. Some organizations require that the label also include the name of the person who prepared the food. However, this isn't really required. It's just commonly done. All a label has to have is the name, the date it was made, and the date it must be discarded. And while we're talking about food package labels, uh, sometimes restaurants will package food that is going to be sold to customers for their use at home, such as bottled salad dressing. That has to be labeled. The label has to include some basic information, the common name of the food or a statement that clearly identifies it. For example, Italian salad dressing. The quantity of it, in this case, 32 ounces. The list of ingredients and sub-ingredients in descending order by weight. This is necessary whenever the item contains two or more ingredients. A list of any artificial colors or flavors that were added. If any chemical preservatives were added, you have to put those on there. The name and place of the business of the manufacturer, the packer, or the distributor who actually put that container together. And the source of each major food allergen contained in the food. This is not necessary if the source is already part of the common name of an ingredient. So in other words, I don't have to identify something as having almonds in it if on the ingredient list it says almonds. These labeling requirements do not apply to customers' leftover food items, of course. Customers' leftover food items, that's on them, man. 
while it's true that refrigeration slows the growth of most bacteria, uh, sometimes do grow well at refrigeration temperatures. When food is refrigerated for long periods of time, these bacteria can grow enough to cause illness. For this reason, ready-to-eat TCS food must be marked if held for longer than 24 hours. The label must indicate when the food will be sold, eaten, or thrown out. Ready-to-eat TCS food can be stored for only seven days, and they can only do that if it's held at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. After seven days, the food has to be discarded. Keep in mind, the count begins on the day the food was prepped or a commercial container was opened. For example, if you made some potato salad today and you put a label on it, that label would have to be seven days from today, including today. Different restaurants have a variety of systems for date marking. Some write the day or date the food was prepped on the label and also the use by day. Some only do the use by day. It's up to your restaurant. Check with your boss. Okay, look, sometimes uh, commercially processed food like this pre-cooked chicken breast is going to have a use-by date that is less than seven days. It's good for the date that was on the chicken. Here's an example. Let's say I'm going to use that chicken and I'm going to make myself some chicken salad. I'm going to mince it up with a bunch of fresh vegetables, blend it together with some yummy mayonnaise, put it in a container, and save it for tomorrow. Now, how long is that chicken salad good for? Well, it's not going to be good for seven days because we already know the expiration date on that pre-cooked chicken is only four days. So the date that I'm going to put on my chicken salad is four days from today. In the same exact way, when you're combining food with different use-by dates in a dish, the discard date of the dish is going to be based on the earliest use-by date of any of the food items. In other words, whatever's going to go bad first, that's the date you're going to put on the package. So... Let's think about jambalaya. Delicious Creole dish with shrimp and rice and andouille sausage. You're going to have one of your employees make some jambalaya for a lunch special. Let's pretend like they're going to make it on December 4th. Seven days after that, it would be December 11th, right? But the discard date needs to be based on the food inside the dish. Which date would you put? Well, in this case, the shrimp's going to go bad on December 8th. The andouille sausage is going to go bad on December 10th. So the date that I'll put on my jambalaya will match the shortest date. The date the shrimp will go bad, December 8th. And this is important. The day that it is made, in this case, December 4th, we're going to throw out when the shrimp will go bad, not when the sausage goes bad, and not seven days from preparation, which would be the 11th. Let's change course just a little bit and talk about storage temperatures. Remember, pathogens can grow when food is not stored at the correct temperature. So it's very important that we store our TCS food at an internal temperature of 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, or if it's a hot food, over 135 degrees Fahrenheit. This simply means that your refrigerator has got to be 41 degrees or lower all the time. If you're going to store frozen food, you've got to store it in a freezer that's going to keep it frozen. That just makes sense, right? And you need to make sure that all of your refrigerated storage units have at least one air temperature measuring device in each one. And it has to be accurate to plus or minus 3 degrees Fahrenheit. The device should be in the warmest part of the refrigerator. So uh, in a refrigerator, it'll be top and front. And in a coldest part of a hot holding unit would be bottom and front. It's important to not overload your cooler or your freezer. Storing too many food items prevents good airflow and makes the units work harder to stay cold. Be aware that frequent opening of the cooler lets warm air inside, and that can affect food safety. It's smart in refrigerators to always use open shelving. Don't line shelves with aluminum foil. Fill it up with sheet pans. This restricts the circulation of cold air. Monitor the food temperatures regularly. Randomly sample the temperature of stored food. You just want to make sure your cooler's working. If the food is not at the correct temperature in a refrigerator, you have to throw it out because you don't know how long it was at that temperature. Food's got to be rotated in storage to maintain quality and limit the growth of pathogens. Food items must be rotated so that those with the earliest use-by or expiration dates are used before items with later dates. Most restaurants use a first-in, first-out system, which is sometimes just called FIFO. It's a method of rotating their refrigerated, their frozen, and their dry food during storage. And the easiest way to do it is just figure out all of your food items used by or expiration date. 
you're going to store the items with the earliest used by or expiration date in front. And once items are shelved, use the items that are stored in front first. Make sure you throw out food that has passed its manufacturer's use by or expiration date. If you ever have a hard time remembering what FIFO stands for, just remember how seniors get off the bus. They make the freshmen wait. So the oldest thing gets off first, the youngest thing sits in the back. Food needs to be stored in ways that prevent cross-contamination, right? Store all of your items in the designated storage area. Store them away from walls and at least six inches off the floor, like you see in the picture. Store single-use items, like sleeves of single-use cups or gloves, in their original packaging. Don't take them out of the packaging and have them just hanging out, catching dust. Make sure when it comes to containers, you're going to store food items in containers that are actually intended for food, please. Use containers that are durable, that are leak-proof, that can be sealed or at least covered. Never, ever, ever use food containers to store chemicals. And by the same token, don't ever put food in an empty chemical container. That's it's terrible. When the, Oh, man, I'm still thinking about that. Keep all your storage areas clean and dry. Clean floors, walls, shelving. In your coolers, in your freezers, in your dry storage areas, your heated holding cabinets. Anywhere where you keep food, keep it clean. Clean up spills and leaks promptly to keep them from contaminating other food. Dollies, carts, transporters, trays, clean those too. Store food in containers that have been cleaned and sanitized only. Store dirty linens far away from food. Store them in a clean, non-absorbent container. They can also be stored in washable laundry bags. And of course, don't keep your food where your employees are keeping their backpacks. That's common sense. Safe food storage starts with wrapping or covering food. After that, how you store the food depends on the type of food and your restaurant's options. Now, store raw meat, poultry, and seafood separate from all other foods, if at all possible, of course. But if they have to be stored in the same refrigerator, use this top-to-bottom order. Ready to eat food at top, seafood, whole cuts of beef and pork, ground meat and ground fish, whole and ground poultry. This order is based on the minimum internal temperatures of each food. But there are a couple exceptions. Of course there are. Raw meat, poultry, and seafood should never be stored above ready-to-eat food in a refrigerator. Juices dripping down onto your peanut butter jelly sandwich. That's gross. However, they can be stored with or even above ready-to-eat food in a freezer if all the items have been commercially processed and packaged. In other words, your pizza can be under some raw hamburger meat in the freezer. Not in the refrigerator, but in the freezer. Now, if the hamburger meat is thawing, uh, that's a different story. Once again, it can definitely not be above ready-to-eat food. You cannot have thawing hamburger meat above ready-to-eat food. However, ground meat and ground fish can be stored above whole cuts of beef and pork when they're thawing, as long as the, pack, as long as the packaging will keep out pathogens and chemicals and not leak. We don't want it to leak. That'd be, that'd be gross. If you can remember the storage order, then you're going to greatly help your ability to remember the minimum internal cooking temperatures for each type of food. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich sits on the top rack because it's not going to be cooked at all, and you don't want any fish blood or beef guts dripping on your sandwich. Chicken has to be cooked hotter than any other item, so it's at the bottom. A steak is cooked to a lower temperature than a burger, so the steak is above the burger, and, and so on and so forth. Remember, a storage order is based on minimum internal cooking temperature. The more something has to be cooked, the further down in the refrigerator it goes. Food has got to be stored in clean, dry locations away from dust and other contaminants. To prevent contamination, never store food in these kinds of areas, like locker rooms or dressing rooms, restrooms or garbage rooms. Rooms... Who does this? Under unshielded sewer lines or leaking water lines? If you're storing your food under an unshielded sewer line, you're a turd. Under stairwells? No. No. If you do find expired, damaged, spoiled, or incorrectly stored food that has become unsafe, you should discard it. Of course. This includes food that is missing a date mark, ready to eat, or TCS food that has exceeded its date mark, and food that has exceeded time temperature requirements. 
If the food must be stored until it can be returned to the vendor, there's a risk that you might contaminate other food. To prevent that, you should do two things. Keep the food you're planning on throwing away, away from the rest of your food and away from the rest of your equipment. Label the food so food handlers do not use it. Two easy things. Hey, slap a do not use sticker on there and you're good to go. And that's it. That's everything that you need to know about storage, receiving, and purchasing. Now, granted, it's not everything you need to know, but it's everything you need to know to pass serve safe, and that's all we really care about today. So listen carefully, go over this a couple times, and you're going to be good to go. I have faith in you. Mm-hmm.